delighted to introduce our next speaker to the stage. Um, Professor Anne Sanson's come all the way up from Melbourne. She's a developmental psychologist whose research expertise is in longitudinal studies of, of children and adolescents' social and emotional health and wellbeing. She's a, she's a principal scientific advisor to the Longitudinal Study of Australian Children and a principal investigator on the Australian Temperament Project, an ongoing 28-year longitudinal study. So there'll be some fantastic stuff that comes out of that. She also advises national longitudinal studies in Norway, New Zealand and Ireland and is on the steering committee for, uh, for the longitudinal st study of Indigenous children and she has over 180 publications. Um, she is going to... She was also an advisor to the ABC, uh, the recent ABC show, which was um, a, over... It was growing up at one, born at one, life at one, and kept going on. So I don't know whether you guys saw that, but it was amazing. If only I could remember the title of it. So please welcome Professor Anne Sanson to the stage. She is going to be uh, presenting Growing Up in Australia, Unlocking the Secret of Child Development. Give a round of applause. Well, thank you, Catherine. Nice to be here at this fascinating conference. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land, the Gadigal people. Um, and to pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, so it's somewhat of a grandiose title that I seem to have ended up on this, uh, for this presentation, and I don't think I can quite do that in 20 minutes, unlock unlocking all the secrets of child development, but I will tell you a bit of what we have learned over 30 years of research, particularly around social and emotional development of children. Oh, wrong way, try going that way. Okay, now I thought I might have to start by this, what do we mean if we're talking about how to start children on a, on a path towards success, what do we mean by success? But I think uh, the presentations we've had today really clearly establish we are on the same page here. What we're thinking about in terms of success is leading towards a meaningful life, a, a life of, of purpose, of engagement, of contributions to, to others and to uh, the community and society, what the ancient Greeks would have called eudaimonia rather than hedonia. So, most of us, when we think about how we can best support our children to get the best start in life, we think about them themselves, their characteristics, their abilities, and we think about what we can do as parents or as teachers um, in the you know, the home and school environment. And those are really important things, but I think it's really important that we remember that it's much more than that as well. We're all familiar with the saying, it takes a village to raise a child. I'd say it takes more than that, it takes a society. So one of the guiding models that we have for, the main guiding model we have for thinking about children's development is called the ecological model, or more, in more jargon terms, the biopsychosocial ecological model of children's development. And what you can see there is the child in the middle with their own attributes and surrounded by their family and their school and so on. But there are other layers in this ecological onion that are also really, really important, and I want to just spend a couple of minutes talking about those, the jargon being the mesosystem, exosystem, and macrosystem. But let me just go through those really briefly. And this, this is an ecological model, so it's really in reinforcing that all of these layers are interact with each other in complex, dynamic ways as a system. So we have the individual child with their own biological characteristics, their own genetic makeup, their health, their temperament, and then their emerging personality and intelligence and so on. And then we have the microsystem that I just referred to that surrounds them of home and school, and I could spend 20 minutes very happily talking about parenting, but like, luckily Michael has already done that for me. Um, school and childcare, what we need within those contexts, some of that's also been covered already. The influence of peers, but I don't have time for that. Importantly, those characteristics themselves interact, those contexts interact. So how does um, a parent's work environment impact on their ability to make close relationships with the school? Or how does it impact on their ability to actually parent? Um, what about how... Um, how much flexibility work gives you, and so on. A whole lot of interactions that are happening there. Again, I'm going to just skim over the surface. Then the exosystem is the level of local communities, that sort of layer. And there are really important things we have to think about. 
Are we creating child-friendly cities and communities for our children? Are there safe and stimulating places for kids to be? Are there engaging, meaningful activities that our teenagers can get involved in? Um, what sort of supports do we provide for our parents? We have belatedly brought in some minimal level of, of um, maternity leave, 18 weeks at the minimum wage, compared to 16 months of, fully, of highly flexible care, um, parental leave in Sweden. Um, all sorts of other supports we need to be thinking about. Are they there to support parents in their role? The media, we've had quite a bit of talk about the media and about screen in general, and I won't elaborate on that other than to say the average child views 200,000 acts of violence by the time they reach 18. The average person, child and adult alike, views to, uh, 20,000 advertisements in every single year. What does this actually do to our attitudes, our behaviours, to consumerism, to obesity, to, to violence? And what are we doing about it? How much pressure are we putting on authorities to influence the media environment our children have? And then at the outer ring of this ecological onion, we have the macro system, where we really need to be thinking about how well is Australia fulfilling its obligations under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, rights to participation, to safety, and so on. What about social and economic equality? Why is this relevant for kids? There's now really strong evidence to show that countries that have got a bigger gap, income gap between the rich and the poor, have poorer outcomes for everyone, rich and poor alike, in terms of mental health, in terms of crime rates, in terms of educational success rates, all sorts of things. So we all, wherever we stand in the social order, ought to be caring about the amount of equality in our societies and lots of other stuff we could talk about. So what I would say, if, if we really are invested in our children, we have to be socially and in the broader sense politically active in trying to create environments that are going to support our children, because we can't do it on our own. OK, let's move a bit closer to the individual child now. And um, uh, Catherine has already introduced this Australian Temperament Project, which we started in 1983 with a big bunch of Victorians who we've now followed all the way through infancy, childhood, adolescence into young adulthood at 28 years of life. And we've done stacks of stuff in that and looking at the things that can go wrong in development, anxiety, depression, substance use, antisocial behaviour, etc., as well as the things that can go right. What are the things that do help to promote really positive development in, in kids? Um, social competence, social responsibility, volunteering, civic-mindedness, positive development in general, and I can't possibly summarize all of that, but let me just cover a couple of, a couple of, the, of the main learnings that have come out of this study. First of all, our study shows very clearly that dif individual differences between kids really matter, and particularly differences in temperament, like how shy or outgoing a child is, how intensely they react to frustration, how volatile they are, things like that which we really need to take on board and to think about you know, if my sh child is shy, do, how do I introduce them to a new, a new experience? It might be different from how I'd introduce a more outgoing child. If I have a highly reactive, volatile child, what extra help do I need to give them to manage their emotions and their behaviour? So we find that temperament matters for whatever outcome we look at. Um, we also see that the early years of life are really important, but that's not all. The later, later childhood and adolescence are also really important, where a child who's had a good start in life, things can then go wrong. But also, there's this everyday magic of resilience, of starting off on a bad path and being able to recover. Importantly, our data support what the Nobel Prize-winning economist uh, James Heckman says, that social and emotional development, social skills, capacity to regulate your own behaviour, your own emotions, are at least as important as the more cognitive factors in creating a, a well-balanced, well-adjusted um, adult at the end of the day. Um, the, I'll just skip the next and go to the, the last, which is the donut or the hole. Um, our data show, as you'd expect for a representative sample, about three quarters of the kids are doing well in their lives at any time that we look at them. But one in four are having serious adjustment problems. 
which might be with substance use, it might with, be with depression, it might be with antisocial behaviour. And I think a question for us is, is that acceptable for a wealthy country like Australia? And it's data like ours that led to the formation of this organisation that you might like to look up. I'm not going to talk about it in detail at all. But the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth is an organisation that's brought together people, researchers, policy makers, practitioners from across a whole range of disciplines to try to tackle the big issues that are facing our kids and young people now, um, with a focus on trying to prevent them in the first place. Prevent the problems, not prevent the children. <laughs> and let me turn now to the, another longitudinal study called Growing Up in Australia, which started in 2004. And it's a much bigger study, tracking kids over time. Um, and it's government funded and its purpose is to provide us with the strong evidence for making the best policies we can to support our kids and young people. It's huge amounts of data. An important thing is that any of you who are researchers, you can access those data and use them yourselves. And one offshoot of that study has been uh, the Life At series that Catherine just mentioned. Uh, I act as an advisor to that, and this series is closely linked to growing up in Australia. What I want to do now in the, my last few minutes is just to talk, show you two excerpts from that series. There's been Life at One, Life at Three, Life at Five, so far aired on ABC TV. We've just been filming for Life at Seven. What this, one of the really important developmental um, accomplishments in childhood is learning to delay gratification, to hold off from immediate rewards for the sake of a, a bigger, better outcome further on. And this just shows us what happens with five-year-old kids when you set them with a, um, a task that challenges their capacity to delay gratification. Where? I'm going to leave. When I'm out, if you want, you can eat the marshmallow. But if you can wait, I'll give you three when I come back. <laughs> okay? Good girl. All right, so I'll just be outside and I'll come back when all the sand is through. One of the early studies using this was done at Stanford with four-year-old children, and they found one-third of the children were able to delay and two-thirds were not. And of that third who were able to delay, when they went to re-interview them, when they were 18 years old, they were all doing very well in their life, academically, socially, emotionally, they were well-adjusted people. Whereas quite a number of those who didn't have that early capacity for self-discipline were having more problems in their lives. <laughs> Daniel is quite a sociable and uh, energetic boy. I think the big challenge for him was just coping with the boredom of being there on his own. Wyatt really wanted that marshmallow and he used a variety of strategies to try to get through that waiting time. Just trying to look away and to take your mind off it is a very good strategy when you're in that situation with the temptation right in front of you. So he starts off using those, but then he uses others that are actually harder to make work for you. It looked like Shine was talking to herself and saying, no, I mustn't do this. So we see little shakes of the head and things like that, uh, just to um, focus herself on, no, I will not eat this. She was seriously tempted by that marshmallow, but she found ways of, of resisting. So she got up and she walked around. She seemed to have very good ways of regulating her own behavior. Okay, so that gives you some illustrations about <laughs> individual differences in strategies and in capacity to delay. And we as parents, as teachers and others can help support our children by giving them graded experiences in holding off in working towards long-term goals. Let me move to another one very quickly, I'm running out of time, but this is about children's growing understanding about what a mind is like. Kids start off thinking the mind is just a mirror of reality. Whatever I think and believe is what reality is like, so you must think and believe exactly the same things. As they grow older, they get to learn that, well, no, actually what's in my mind might not be in your mind, so I can lie and deceive. So let's see what happens here. Whoops. 
Can we start that one? Can people at the other end do that? This experiment, pioneered by American child psychologists in 1965, will determine which one of our five-year-olds has the cognitive skills necessary to tell a little white lie. Do you want to sit on that chair? Early on, kids think that everything that I think, you think, everything I believe, you believe, everything I know, you know. Um, but then they get to say, say, oh, well, no, actually, things in my head are just in my head, so I can lie, I can deceive, I can trick. So we have a real demonstration of the growing sense of morality in children. OK. Right in there. I've got toys in here. All the toys in this experiment have a familiar sound to young children. They have to say what the toy is without looking. A baby. The baby. Horse. Horse. A horsey. Good girl. You got it right. The final toy, Dorothy okay. the dinosaur, will be our secret lie detector. I'm going to play the toy now. But remember, no We've placed a musical greeting card underneath the toy to produce a totally a random noise. No peeking, okay? I'll be gone. No. The child won't be able to guess the identity of the toy based on the sound. So if they want to guess correctly, they'll have to sneak a peek. I'm coming back now, Anastasia. Okay. It's a Dorothy dinosaur. I'm Dorothy the dinosaur. Dorothy, a dinosaur. Even though they proudly reveal it was Dorothy, will they admit to breaking the rules and peeking? When I was gone, did you turn your head to the side? No. I didn't. Did you turn your body around? My eyes were shut like this and I didn't look. To be absolutely certain the child is really telling a lie, we ask three times if they looked. Did you turn your head to the no. side? No. Did you move around in your chair? No. Did you take a peek? No. I didn't even look. Time after time, Did each child confidently the denies they've broken the rules. Did you take a peek? <laughs> OK, so whoops. Um, so what, uh, virtually all the children lied in that experiment. Interestingly, at Life at Seven, which we've just filmed, they just about all have learned the value of honesty over appearing good, appearing clever, appearing, um, or gaining rewards through telling lies. Again, something that parents and teachers can help support in children's development. I've got one minute to go. I've got the same slide as Michael. That just shows that us psychologists think, the way, think about the world in the same way. So uh, for me, my take on this slide about how we should support our, our children's development or not is that we need to be thinking about our children's abilities and their disabilities, in this case, their small feet. And we should be trying to design pathways for them without obstacles, if, in, if, if possible. So planning ahead for them and, as a society, thinking about how we can design design life pathways for our children that don't have these obstacles. And there's a lot more that I could say about, about all of this, but I'm out of time, so thank you.